Hi guys, I'm going to go through the different roles played in the forge in this video. A lot of the forge can be done in different ways, some more efficient and faster than others, but I think the majority of games tend to end at the same difficult parts toward the end of the forge. So instead of going through every single stage of the forge, I'm going to be focusing on those more difficult parts with each of the roles we can play. This guide will also be more geared towards playing with random teams rather than as a guide for a coordinated team as a whole. I will be listing the characters that I prefer to use for the different roles, but of course a lot of that is mostly opinion. None of the roles are character specific and can be played successfully by multiple characters. Also, the experience of playing the forge with a coordinated team makes the forge a lot easier. You can come up with very specific plans as a team and execute those plans over voice chat. But when I'm playing with a random team and our only means of communication is by typing in the chat, this is how I've been playing the different roles in the forge. Let's start with the runner decoy lure, whatever you call it. This is the person that keeps the attention of a barilla while the rest of the team is busy clearing everything else. This role is typically played by Wes or Woody, but I prefer using Wilson as long as there is another Wilson in the team and as long as there is a character that can give me the feathered reed tunic. I'll explain a little later why I prefer Wilson as the runner. The feathered reed tunic is body armor that increases movement speed by 10% and you can only get it from characters that start with the armor. In this case, we had a willow who traded armor with me. The other item I need as the runner is the feathered wreath which increases movement speed by 20%. So the runner's first real task will come after the first wave of scorpions. I still have a little time to help the team focus down the mobs. But as soon as Pugna says send in the Borilla, the runner should go to the top circle, which is the circle opposite of where the team spawns. It's now the runner's job to maintain the Borilla's aggro and keep it away from the rest of the team. The reason being, it's only the runner with the extra speed items that can actually kite the Borilla. If my ping is relatively low, I can attack the Borilla three times with a dart before dodging. A lot of the time, runners will use Molten Darts to kite the Borilla, I guess so they can use the Molten Darts special to break the Borilla's guard. I think that's fine, but I don't do that because I like to fire into the rest of the mobs with a Barrage Dart when the Barrage Dart special is available and the Borilla is in guard. Either way is fine for this first Borilla. I do have a small reason for using the Barrage Dart and not the Molten Dart for the second Borilla. After the first Borilla dies, next part will have two Borilla that will spawn from the left and right spawn points relative to the team's spawn point. The runner should then go to one of the sides while the rest of the team fights the other Borilla. I'm going to kite this Borilla towards the team's spawning area. The reason I do this is because after a certain amount of damage has been done to one of the Borillas, a Crocomander and some pigs will spawn from the top circle. I do not want those to aggro onto me. Even with a 30% speed boost, the runner cannot dodge the Crocomander's ranged attack. A coordinated team will know to fight the Crocomander and the pigs as soon as they spawn, but in a random team, you can eliminate the possibility of the Crocomander interrupting you while you kite the Borilla by simply staying in this area.
After your team takes down the other Barilla, a common mistake for the team is to go directly for the Barilla that the runner is kiting. What the team should be doing instead is to go to the top circle and wait. Another Croc Commander will spawn from the top circle, as well as Scorpions and Turtles from the side. It's okay for them to focus down the Croc Commander first, even if the Turtles and Scorpions came after me. The runner can still aggro and kite the Barilla. The reason I do not use the Molten Dart when kiting the second Barilla in a random team is because it's not the runner's job to damage the Barilla. After one of the Barillas die, the health of the remaining Barilla will determine when the final boss spawns. I don't know the exact percentage of health the Barilla has to reach before the Grand Forge Warrior spawns, but I'm sure that is what determines it. And if my team decided to attack it before the rest of the mobs were clear, I want the Barilla I'm kiting to have as much health as possible. It's the runner's job to keep it away from the rest of the team while keeping its health high enough so that the final boss doesn't appear until the rest of the mobs are clear. Now that the mobs have all been cleared, it's the proper time for the team to kill the Barilla I've been kiting. Now I can expect the Barilla's health percentage to drop quickly, and soon the Grand Forge Warrior will spawn. When Pugna starts talking at this point, be prepared to move to the top circle and anticipate the Warrior. It shouldn't take long for the team to kill the remaining Barilla, but you can do your last bit of kiting as the runner during this point. Just pull the final boss by attacking it from a safe distance. At this point, the warrior has no ranged attack and can only walk towards you. Now my job as the runner is mostly over. I did it as Wilson, and I never lost the aggro of the Barillas that I had the kite. This is the reason I don't value Wes as much. The job of the runner can be done easily without Wes's ability to maintain the aggro of creeps. And once you are done with that part, I would much rather be Wilson because of how valuable Wilson's ability to revive is in this last part. In this last part, I turn back into a dart user. I will still keep my speed equipment on because it will help me a little if I have to revive my teammates as Wilson. It also helps to have the speed if things start to fall apart and I have to move the warrior away from the rest of the team. But depending on how well the team works together in this last part, that doesn't necessarily have to happen. I dropped the barrage darts and picked up the molten darts for this last part. Special attacks that can stun the warrior, like the special attack of the molten dart, are very valuable, particularly at the very end. Anyone with a stun can help the healer a lot by saving their special attack for the moment right before the heal. So if I see the green circle from the healer, I'm going to use the special attack of the molten dart to help keep the warrior in place. The really great thing about this is I don't even have to be coordinated with the healer. The healer might not even know that I'm doing this. At this point, it's not that crucial yet, but after the warrior summons the pigs and all of the pigs are destroyed, the warrior will no longer wander directly into the area of the heal. This is when helping your healer get the sleep right is very important.
The healer is very important to me when the pigs are summoned, and I think the healer was having trouble casting, so I ran straight for the healer and tried to get the attention of the pigs. I was a little late with the molten dart here, and the warrior is going to avoid the sleep now. I don't think it's good to stay inside of the heal at this point. The warrior will do massive damage to the team by remaining outside and firing its range attack into everyone clumped up inside. This resulted in the death of our healer, and without the healer, everyone will start dying. This can very often happen towards the end, especially in random teams. I think the right thing to do is for one person to pull the warrior away from the dead teammates and to make it safe for a Wilson or for anyone that is alive to resurrect everyone. It will very often end in defeat if you try to resurrect your teammates while the warrior is around or if you try to put it to sleep when only a few players are left alive to keep the warrior in place. At this point, the warrior cannot be kited indefinitely anymore without getting hit even with all the speed items because it now has a lunging melee attack as well as a ranged attack. But you can still lead it away from the rest of the team and sacrifice yourself so that a Wilson or whoever can resurrect safely.
The next role I'm playing is the healer. I prefer either Wicker Bottom or Winona for the healer, although anyone that can use a staff can potentially be the healer. Wicker Bottom's ability to buff her next spell also affects the strength of the heal, which makes her my favorite for this role. But Winona's 10% faster cooldown rate is a decent second for me. Although I like Wicker Bottom's effect better, Winona has a lot more health which is good to have as a healer and as a role that is very important throughout the entire game. The items for the healer are the Living Staff, Silk and Wood Armor for 10% faster cooldown, and the Crystal Tiara for another 10% faster cooldown. Later on though, I think it is much better for the healer to replace the Crystal Tiara with the Woven Garland. The Woven Garland will increase the effect of the healing by 20%. I think you can keep switching between the Crystal Tiara and the Woven Garland to get the benefit of both, but I don't suggest doing that. Often you will end up casting just as often or even less often than if you just kept the Woven Garland on the whole time. If you don't switch between the items, you will not have a problem casting the heal at the right place and time whenever it is available. I think my job as the healer is mainly to keep the tanks in my team alive. Anyone else that needs the heal should go to the tanks. It's a little more complicated if you are a healer that also uses the Petrify book. But you can constantly keep a whole group of mobs asleep or petrified by alternating between the two while still keeping your tanks healthy. The way to do that is to petrify and sleep the groups of mobs around your tanks. It shouldn't matter if the mobs are near, as long as you can disable them indefinitely and the team can focus them down one by one. But I'm Winona here and all I really have to do is focus on healing. We are up to the part with the two barillas at this point. And after dealing a certain amount of damage to one of the Barillas, the first wave of Croquamanders is about to spawn at the top circle. So as soon as Pugna starts talking here, I move towards the top circle to pull the Croquamander away from our runner. If the team or the runner is aware of this happening, you won't need to do that. But in a random team, I suggest pulling the Croquamander every time to make sure your runner is safe. Before we started this round, I decided to tell them to save a special attack for the moment right before the heal. Unlike being the Molten Dart user previously when it didn't matter if the healer knew what I was doing, this time I'm the healer and I have to depend on them. If a random team doesn't follow the advice though, it is still possible to sleep the barrier a little consistently in the end. The way I do it is to watch the tanks and try to place the heal when the Borilla is occupied with the tanks that are engaging it. Don't cast the heal if the barrier is attacking someone other than the tanks, and don't cast the heal if the barrier is attacking a tank that is not fighting back. I think a crucial part of the healer's role is when the warrior summons the pigs. I have to make sure that I can get the heal out in time. If the heal is on cooldown because I have to heal the team, then I have to make sure that nothing is going to attack me and that I'm free to use the heal as soon as it is available. Ideally, I would like to place the heal right on the boss and put it to sleep, but with everyone having their own agenda at this point in a random team, it can sometimes be impossible. But even if I am not able to put the warrior to sleep immediately, it is good to know that the warrior is not yet at the point when it completely avoids the sleep. Until the pigs are dead, it will still be possible to lure the warrior into area of the sleep. So what the team should do while I'm trying to get the sleep out is to first eliminate the banners and then pull everything into the sleep. From there, the fire staff user would ideally use the cataclysm on everything. And if combined with a few other area of effect specials from the rest of the teammates, the pigs should be dead in no time. Unfortunately, I don't think our fire staff user was ready for this. It was a lot more difficult than it should have been, but we got through it anyway. The team was starting to fall apart here. I couldn't get the sleep in place and Wilson was not noticing our dead allies. Again, when this happens, someone should try to pull the warrior away from the dead allies so that the rest can resurrect safely. Even if I was the healer, I decided that I should probably do it, even if I die from it. We are much better off if I give Wilson enough time to resurrect everyone.
Now I'm going to play the Infernal Staff or Fire Staff user. This is an obvious role for Willow because of her 10% increased fire damage, but I also like Wicker Bottom for the Fire Staff. While Willow gets the damage benefit with the normal attacks, the Fire Staff's special attack, Cataclysm, is much stronger on Wicker Bottom. This is because the buff she gains in her next spell is higher than 10%. And while Willow will do more overall damage because of the 10% increase that also affects the normal damage of the Fire Staff, Wickerbottom's spell buff comes in handy when the Boyer calls in the pigs. Wickerbottom is the only one that can one-shot the pigs. The items for this role are the Infernal Staff, Silken Wood Armor for 10% cooldown, and the Clairvoyant Crown for 25% magic damage dealt and 10% cooldown. The Clairvoyant Crown, however, drops pretty late in the game, so if the healer in the team switches from Crystal Tiara to Woven Garland, then the Crystal Tiara should be used until the Clairvoyant Crown drops. Unfortunately, sometimes only one Silken Wood Armor drops, and since that should probably go to the healer, I had to stick with my original armor instead in this game. But it's not that much of a difference in terms of cooldown. Wicker Bottom starting armor is the Reed Tunic which gives 5% faster cooldown as opposed to the 10% from the Silken Wood Armor. It's fairly simple being the Fire Staff user. Stay behind your tanks, focus on what they focus on, and try not to piss off your team too much by waking up groups of mobs that should not have been woken up yet. The only thing you can do as the Fire Staff user that might not be common is to save the Cataclysm before the pigs come. In order to do this, I have to know when the Boreer is about to summon the pigs. The first stage of the Boreer is when its only attack is a melee swing. The second stage is when it gains its ranged attack, when it plunges its hand into the ground and fires in a straight line that can hit us twice. The third stage is when it gains the spinning attack. It is after the third stage that the Boreer will summon the pigs. So when I see the spinning attack, I know that the pigs are at next and I will stop using the Cataclysm to make sure that it is available when the pigs arrive. The Woody was playing the runner in this game, but I don't like picking Woody as the runner if we already have two tanks in the team. There are only enough drops to make two really good tanks and now the Woody is choosing to stay ranged with his axe. Not only is Woody's damage very low at this point, but the axe as a ranged weapon tends to call the Boreer's attention away from the tanks. This is the same reason why Woody makes a good decoy, but this just kept causing Woody to die and our Wilson had to keep reviving him which dropped our team damage even more. When I play Woody as the runner, I make sure that there is only one other tank, and I convert myself into the tank role after my job as the runner is done. With the lower team DPS and the constant need to revive Woody, this took a really long time. Fortunately, the heals were landing well and we were able to make it in the end. The dart user is a damage dealer, similar to the fire staff user. Just stay behind your tanks and focus what they focus. I have no real preference for this character. I would probably choose Wilson for the extra benefits to the team if I had to pick one. I think most Wilsons will probably fall into this role apart from being the one to resurrect teammates, but anyone that can use darts can play this role. The items for the dart user are barrage darts, then molten darts for the weapon, jagged wood armor for 10% physical damage, and the barbed helm, nox helm or resplendent nox helm for 10 or 15% more physical damage. An increase in physical damage does affect the damage of even the molten darts. While the physical damage helms might look good on our tanks, they do not increase their ability to tank. And while it looks like the tanks do a lot of damage, in general, the dart users that can constantly attack without interruption will be able to do significantly more damage than the tanks. Also, there are other armors for the head and body that are perfect for increasing durability of the tanks. One thing you can do as a dart user if you want to do more damage is to line up barrage darts in one area where you know you will fight so that you can use the specials one after the other. The resplendent Nox Helm drop, this means that both me and Wilson are now at plus 15% damage from our headgear, which is perfect since we are the dart users. We both have Molten Darts, which do more damage than the Barrage Darts. 
The second Molten Dart will only drop if there is no Wigfrid in the team. If a Wigfrid is present, instead of the second Molten Dart, the Spiral Spear will drop. If you are playing Weber, you don't have to worry about the spiders waking the Boreer from its sleep. The spiders stop attacking as soon as you stop attacking. Another thing that you can do during the pig phase is for one person to pull the Boreer away from everything else while the team focuses down the pigs. In most random teams, getting everything to sleep during this phase will not happen very often. But of course, it isn't the only way to get through this part. I just experience a much higher success rate when the team is able to use the sleep and cast the Cataclysm on all of the pigs. The tanks are the damaged sponges of the team. I think they should be with the healer throughout most of the game. In a random team, if the healer doesn't come to me, then I go to the healer and I will fight mostly where the healer drops the heal. It is the healer's job to keep me alive and it is my job to tank as much as possible so that the ranged damage dealers are free to constantly do damage. I do prefer either WX or Wigfrid in this role. While Wolfgang, Woody, and Winona have more HP, WX has the defensive shock ability which I think is very useful as a tank, and I think it more than makes up for the lower HP. Wigfrid is my favorite tank though, because like Winona, Wigfrid can turn into range during the Scorpion stage when melee will tend to do a lot less damage. The Scorpions are definitely not a dangerous part of the game, but it can take a while when you have two or more melee in the group. Additionally, when Wigfrid is in the game, the Spiral Spear drops which I think is clearly the best melee weapon in the game. And finally, Wigfrid increases the group's damage, which I think is a good way to go for the group speed achievement. The weapon for the tank is either the Hammer, Spear, or Lucy for Woody. For the armor, it should eventually be the Steadfast Stone Armor, which gives 90% protection and knockback resistance. The Borillas and the Boreas attacks will push the tanks backwards significantly with each attack if they do not wear the Steadfast Stone Armor. There will always be two Steadfast Stone Armor dropped in the game, so this is perfect if your team has two tanks. However, it does reduce movement by 15%, so either the Wood Armor or Stone Splint Male is probably better until the part with the Borillas. For the Head Armor, the tanks should use the Flower Headband, which increases the effect of the healing received of whoever wears it by 25%. The other Head Armor for the tank is the Blossom Wreath, which increases 2 HP every second, up to 80% of the tank's total HP. These two head items, along with the two steadfast stone armors, will make the tanks very durable, especially if you combine it with a healer that uses the woven garland. However, the blossomed wreath is not a guaranteed drop, so in case it doesn't drop and there are two tanks in the team, one of the tanks should just wear one of the extra damage helms. You can press the right-click button to prepare the special attack in advance while you hold down the F button to do the normal attacks. I'm using the Spiral Spear's special ability here to try to keep the Boreer in place for the heal. As a tank, I do not completely disregard dying, but at the same time, I keep myself alive by depending on the healer and not by avoiding damage. A tank is useless if it has to avoid taking damage and transfer the aggro towards the damage dealers in the team because it cannot keep itself alive. That's all for now guys, I hope this guide will help your success rate in the Forge, especially if you sometimes play with random non-voice chat teams. The Forge is a limited time event, but I have a feeling it will eventually come back or it will be added into the main game in the future.